The MSP contract negotiation series, we discuss limitation of liability and indemnification clauses. That's our topic on today's MSP Zone. You're entering the MSP Zone, a podcast for the managed services community, covering news, analysis, and interviews from around the globe. Elevate your MSP game by staying in the MSP Zone. And now, your host, Charles Weaver. Welcome to the MSP Zone. Welcome specifically to the MSP Contract Negotiation Series. This is an ongoing um, series of podcast episodes where we talk about legal contract elements that are very common in the managed services sector. We talk about very common, commonly seen scenarios involving these agreements, and we talk about very commonly and effective, we hope, um, arguments uh, or uh, guidance, shall we say, to help you better understand what is going on in that whole legal area and hopefully get you some better outcomes in your relationships and in your uh, ultimately leading to closed deals. I mean, that's what all this is about ultimately, right? Um, And here to help us compress three years of law school into a 30-minute podcast is our old friend Rob Scott. Rob, welcome. Good to be here, Charlie. We're not actually going to do three years of compressed law school, and I don't think yeah, anyone. I was about to say I don't know where you went to law school. Actually, I do, but <laughs> I know for sure that they couldn't do anything uh, compressed, and we can't get three years done on any topic uh, in a short period of time. But but I think we've got a digestible number of issues, and I candidly believe that the issues that we're going to talk about today are the most important issues in managed services. No doubt, no doubt. So to set the stage here, um, we, we have talked previously about you know the importance of right, all of this is in the context of a managed services agreement, which which are a, a set, not one, but a set of documents that a, a, a common a typical MSP might use in the in the course of their managed services practice to codify, to document the relationship they have with a managed services customer. And previously we talked about term, right? The term length, how to, um, why that's important and and some of the common things that associate themselves with with term uh, clauses in the agreement. Today we're talking about, as Rob said, a limitation of liability and indemnification. Two elements that, that are very closely aligned, but ultra- ultra critical to your ability to manage risk. And God knows we've got a lot of risk out there in the world. MSPs have a lot of risk, a lot of responsibility. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So Rob, I'm going to start off with an easy one. Um, you know, uh, no, probably no first year lawsuit would, would get this, but what is an, what is a limitation of liability clause? The limitation of liability clause is a section of a contract that describes the circumstances under which one party or the other can recover in damages in the event of a lawsuit and frequently excludes certain types of damages, caps other types of damages, and may include carve-outs for types of damages that would be considered uncapped in the event of litigation. So I'm a customer, you're my MSP, and you hand me a, an agreement that says you're going to be my managed service provider, and in it says, um, it, now, who, who is typically, I mean, is, is this something that exists in most uh, typical MSP agreements to begin with, and, and who does it favor at the beginning? Well, I, I think that any really good managed services contract is going to have a very explicit uh, and and uh, perhaps even detailed uh, limitation of liability. So they, they are common. Um, how you word them, how you structure them, there, there are some subtleties that I think are unique to managed services. But in essence, what 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 our you know documents will say is that. The provider will not be responsible under any circumstances 
for indirect or inconsequential damages, such as lost profits or business interruption. And so there'll be no recovery for, for example, punitive damages. No, uh, Rob, like I'm going to stop part. you there. If I'm if I didn't go to law school and I'm wondering, okay, wow, what's punitive and what's you know norm, you know profits, lost profits? What what are some of those common scenarios and why are those clauses in this in this boilerplate limitation liability clause? Well, look, I mean, we heard about the McDonald's coffee case, right? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, from the '80s. McDonald's, she gets burned and she gets three million dollars in punitive damages. Um, you know, and it has become relatively um, market in IT related contracts that both parties will agree that neither party will uh, be able to recover on indirects such as punitives or uh, other uh, inconsequential damages. You know, you know, out of pockets only basically is, is what is typical. Okay, so so there's a there, it's not going to be a, a get rich quick scheme for any breach and, and a and a subsequent uh, litigation is is basically what we're saying. That's right. We're saying that you know highly speculative theories of recovery, uh, anything that would be punitive in nature, both parties will agree that neither will recover those against each other. Okay. So, so lost profits um, would be in that category of it's too speculative, as you put it, it's too indirect. We're really talking about, I mean, would 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 a um, we've talked a lot about on the on this program, you and I, um, data breach costs, right? Just the just the the hard cost of of obtaining legal counsel, yeah. issuing the notices. So there, there are there are aspects of a data breach that you know um, probably are. Um, um, direct and there are aspects that are indirect. We actually have included a provision that is customer favorable. This isn't something I would recommend to an MSP, but when we represent end users, we include a clause in the limitation of liability that says for purposes of this agreement, uh, breach incident response costs, including but not limited to uh, credit monitoring notice um, reputation management, forensic, and legal fees are considered directs for purposes of the limitation of liability. Because otherwise it is, as you say, uh, Charles, a little unclear on which would be what. And you can make an argument, and arguments have been made in many data privacy cases, that the damages that are alleged to be recovered in those cases are not uh, direct and therefore not recoverable. So um, it's something that... that uh, we typically would specify as as being non-direct for an MSP uh, if we're representing the end user. But for MSPs, I like the broad definition of indirect. So it's a complete exclusion. And then, you know, if you have an opportunity to argue it's excluded, then you can. Um, what that means is that um, if there's a claim, they're going to have to pursue different types of damages. And that is what the directs are. And that's really where most of the negotiating happens. In our agreements, we typically recommend that the customer be offered six months of the services giving rise to the claim. So take the revenue that the customer pays for the services that gave rise to the claim per month and then multiply that times six. And that's your cap. And then we recommend to do the greater of that or the available proceeds of the MSP Alliance or other professional liability insurance. And that's the formulation that you'll see in our documents. So it's really clear of what will be included. It's, it's fairly clear on what's not included and, and everybody goes in knowing r- really what they're, what they're dealing with, which I, th- I think is good. Um, and, and the primary thing here, Charles, is that professional liability insurance is the primary risk transfer mechanism. Most MSPs are going to have either a million dollars or two million dollars in coverage. The six month of uh, six months of fees is a, is is a market sort of number, but when you offer the greater of the six months or the insurance, what you're really saying is the the MSP will be on the hook for claims that are included within their liability, but for which there's no coverage. But that part will be very limited to six months of revenue for the service giving rise to the claim. And otherwise, uh, 
the insurance is there and there's not going to be anything in the in the contract that limits the customer's ability to access the insurance. So so for those of you out there wondering what what just happened, what you've given your your sales team at your MSP business, if you have this type of thing that Rob just talked about, you have a really compelling, I mean a really strong case for why not just the value inherent of the managed services the customer is receiving, but also the the risk, the safety net beneath that relationship is there, so protecting the customer in, in those in those cases. I, Rob, I think that's just really it's really powerful how that works together with the insurance. Well, the insurance is incredibly powerful, Charles. You know how hard we worked in in '08 timeframe with Lloyd's of London to develop this master policy around the Beasley tech media policy, which many of the members have and many of my clients have and, and, and for which our documents are set up. Uh, you know, the, the language in the indemnity section is exactly as set forth in the Beasley policy. Um, but, but more importantly, Charles, it's great for the MSP because the MSP now has limited its liability for uncovered claims to a very small amount of revenue. And as at the same time for one fee per year, been able to tell each customer, yes, we're limited to six months, but if it's covered, we have a million dollars with Beasley underwritten by Lloyd's of London, and it covers any uh, act or omission that we do in the course of uh, discharging the service. Uh, as very broad. And so to your point, uh, MSPs that pursue this approach uh, have a very compelling uh, presentation to offer to customers that those that haven't created this um, solution won't have. And at the same time, they're taking on less risk. Good for the client, good for the provider. Everybody wins. I, I love it. And now I, I do want to uh, focus in on something you just said, which is it covers the acts or omissions of the MSP. That seems to indicate, as we're going to talk about next, that there could be incidents outside of the MSP's direct fault that may we need to discuss. And that leads me to my next question, which is we've just defined, you've just defined limitation liabilities uh, the term indemnification, indemnifying something, uh, is used a lot. How how do you differentiate limitation of liability and indemnification? So, limitation of liability talks in terms of what types of recoveries can be made in court if liability is proven. Indemnity refers to who will defend and pay for claims by third parties where both. Uh, the uh, vendor and the provide both the provider and the customer may be sued. So, okay, j- before you continue, w- all right, we're talking about a supply chain attack, not the fault of the customer or the MSP, let's say, and but both parties are involved. Is is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So let's take a, an incident where there's a ransomware attack uh, in the customer agreement. Uh, it's going to talk about indemnities. You know, the typical indemnities that MSPs offer are, you know, will agree to indemnify you and hold you harmless if someone brings a lawsuit against you related to our I, related to IP, right? And if we steal your information, like for breach of the confidentiality agreement or for any theft of trade secrets, those would be uh, things that we would indemnify. Uh, other than that, you know, typically MSPs do not agree to indemnify their customers for very much. The question is, you know, now the, there's an incident in ransomware with an RMM tool and the customer um, brings a lawsuit against the RMM provider and the MSP. The indemnity agreement between the RMM provider and the MSP says the MSP pays. So customer sues RMM company and MSP pays both to defend and to pay any settlement or judgment. It, 
it, it appears so. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, a common managed services agreement would likely have an indemnification clause in it, and you you kind of alluded to uh, by name, you know, two different sections of an indemnification clause or, or two different components. One is indemnica- indemnification by the provider and indemnification by the client. How do those operate? And you know how, how do they fit together in this in the grand scheme of things? So the indemnification, the types of issues for which the customer will require indemnification, the types of issues that the provider will require indemnification are not the same. And that's why you need separate sections. Because if you think about the, the issue that you would be most concerning from an MSP's perspective about indemnity, you know, the MSP wants uh, the customer to indemnify it, for example, for any claims that are brought against it by third parties, by regulators, by, right? If, if, if the MSP gets in trouble, think Hillary Clinton. If the MSP gets in trouble because of the behavior of the customer, the customer should indemnify and defend that MSP. So I, those so- aren't the those aren't the same concerns that the customer has. No, no. Okay, so in that in that case, the the MSP gets a subpoena, and the MSP is in hot water for something that is on that server. Let's just use that example. And the the MSP would say, "Well, wait a minute. I shouldn't have to foot the bill here. It, that that the, the customer should should uh, s- support me or uh, indemnify me, defend me. Is that that that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. You, the indemnity here I, i'm gonna hire this lawyer you got to pay i've got to spend money out of pocket to go testify in front of congress and i need you know people to you know do some uh training and i want to have a do some mock um sessions and do pre- preparation and maybe i need to buy some uh exhibits or hire someone to do audio visual work for me you know all of those things would be subject to indemnity and and again, we're assuming in that facts pattern that 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 it's not the MSP's fault, right? The the MSP is just responding yeah. to an incurring cost because yeah, of something. yeah, 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 and yeah. It's not the MSP's fault. This is just you know they got brought in because you know the typical scenario, Charles, is there's a security incident at the MSP's customers that affects its clients. Now its clients have claims. What? Can you explain that? So the, we're talking about the MSP's customer is, is at fault. And- ransomware. Okay. Um, the MSP's customer is the one that suffers the ransomware. Got it. Through, the MSP's through their fault. The customer brings a lawsuit against the, the, uh, the RMM provider and the MSP. Uh, who has to pay? Does the uh, RMM tool provider have to pay to defend the MSP? Does the MSP have to pay to defend the RMM tool? Does the customer have to indemnify the provider even for claims that it brings or that its customer brings? These are, you know, all questions that are covered by indemnity. Who pays to defend and resolve a case brought by a third party to the contract. It, be, knowing that all MSPs have similar agreements and clauses, meaning indemnification clauses in their agreements with RMM vendors, ticketing vendors, backup vendors, security vendors, documentation, password manager vendors, all, all types of vendors. It, it, regardless of what that indemnification says, is the MSP going to have indemnification clauses of its own that potentially conflict with those other indemnification they could, agreements? They, they could because regardless of what the RMM tools agreement is with the MSP, the MSP's agreement is separate from and therefore couldn't conflict in a, in a legal sense. It would never become in conflict is what you're saying. That's right. They, they, they don't, they, there's no, there's no requirement that they be congruent. Okay. Okay. Uh, because they were talking about who would pay for as between two separate parties. 
it's not a three way it's not a three way agreement in, in that way. You know what I'm saying? Got it. No, that 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 makes a lot of sense. So, but, but but when you start talking about you know third party supply chain risks, I think it brings in a whole separate issue uh, of disclosure. Uh, it's one thing to say uh, in li- I limit my liability for claims by third parties, but I do think you you you're the requirement that that disclosure be more uh, thorough is a requirement, and that's why we've developed the schedule of third party services. And they've begun to make that available to the community because, you know, without that more detailed schedule, uh, you really can't, uh, in my mind, argue strongly that the waiver of the right to bring a claim against the MSP by the customer uh, would be enforceable in court without the details that are provided in that schedule of third party services which include the vendor's name, what they're being used for, a link to their licensing and end user terms, and a link to their privacy policy. It's a lot more transparency, no doubt, given to the customer. And I like that. And listen, I think, Charles, one of the key foundations of the evolving landscape of international privacy law is transparency and disclosure. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think, I think the move here to to make that and soon other, you know, doc, document legal templates available to MSP Alliance members is so critical because it, it it's going to standardize and it's going to update across the board those transparency and other um, factors that make. I, look, I honestly think, Rob, this is going to make it easier. For, for entities to contract and do business with MSPs and vice versa and, and do so with a lot more assurance and risk planning before the relationship even begins. Well, yeah, the way I think about it is in Texas, for example, we have the Texas Real Estate Commission and they promulgate standard forms for home sales and condo rentals and lease agreements. And what happens is the market gets you know accustomed to what they say and if it doesn't cover exactly what needs to be covered, there's a special provision section that people, you know, write in. But there's a comfort on both sides of knowing that you've got a standard form that's not heavily one side or the other that's been promulgated and vetted and is being used in the marketplace. And I think the MSP Alliance's legal forms are going to be like that in, in some ways. Yeah. So that brings me to my last point, which is we're circling back again to limitation of liability. And, and I want to talk about carve-outs. What, what are limitation of liability carve-outs in a common managed services agreement? So a carve-out refers to a category of claim for which the limitation of liability won't apply in the event of litigation. The language that you'd look for is something like, Except for claims related to gross negligence and willful misconduct, the provider's um, liability for any reason, for any claim, regardless of whether in tort or contract, shall be limited to the greater of six months of fees related to giving rise to the claim or the proceeds of applicable insurance. It's that except language is the carve out. The claims that are not included within the scope of the limitation of liability and are therefore referred to as uncapped are what the carve-outs are. For purposes of managed services, the only thing that should be carved out is um, a theft of of, of the customer's trade secrets or a breach of the confidentiality provisions. Uh, tr- and, triggers and, that would things that would trigger the insurance or no? No, we, we still we still want the cap. Yeah, you know, we want all covered claims to be subject to the cap. Okay. Uh, this really isn't a question about whether it's covered or not. This is a question about whether it's capped or not. I, you could have a you could have a covered, capped or uncapped claim. And you could have an uncovered, capped, or un- uncapped claim. And the worst would be the uncovered, uncapped. That's the absolute no-no. No, no, no end in sight to, the, to the, the, the bleed of green. Right. So uncovered, uncapped, we don't do that. 
uh, I think for managed services, uncapped anything except something that's, you know, you know, wouldn't be enforceable anyway. Like, for example, in many jurisdictions, including New York, you can't limit your liability for willful misconduct and gross negligence. It's not legal to do so. So, um, yeah, I, I just think that any any carve outs, anything uncapped is a really serious thing to look at. Carve outs will kill deals. There are many deals that for managed services at market rates with carve outs that are too broad that those contracts are worthless or even uh, uh, create liability to the customer, to the provider. So may I, may I inquire then that it, it sounds like you're in favor of having a limitation of liability carve out section in a managed services agreement, but doing so with very carefully, carefully sculpted um, accuracy. Did I get that? Very, right? it, yes. It needs to be very, very, very narrowly tailored. Well, here and here's another thing, right? If we, we talk about um, templates, right? I mean, we, we've you and I have talked about this a lot. Where you, these circa 2000, you know, 1999, 2000 web hosting agreements that used to go around, and I think they still do. And someone like updated them and, and turned them into, uh, you know, they put in the t- title, you know, managed services agreement. And they they had very loose, very outdated now at this point, 21 years old or more, um, very outdated phraseology. And it's very dangerous to use that stuff. And that's why it's so important to have something that's crafted for MSPs. Um, I don't know, Rob, if you see a lot of those those really ancient agreement templates floating around anymore, but... Um, Look, Charles, as you know, one of the most common first engagements that we get from an MSP is a customer contract review. And I frequently have people tell me, you know, we've got an agreement that we cobbled together or, you know, a vendor gave us a sample. I, lo- or- I, I love those. I'm, I'm seeing those a lot now. Or the vendors actually give it out. H- how likely are you going to have a good indemnification clause in that vendor provided agreement. I got to wonder, you know, we should, we should maybe download some of them and look at them. But um, my guess is that um, they definitely are not looking at it from the same perspective as, as what we're looking at. Yeah. They're, they're looking at it as a way to help MSPs, you know, deploy more of their tool and to provide support. You know, it's more of a, it's more of a partner support, concept of course you know these people are not lawyers and able to practice law or give legal advice to anybody um and so they're really just offering templates you know as either for a business reason or as a commercial you know commercial reason and really you know what matters is what winds up in the documents you can start with a template but it's it's where you get to at the end that matters and what I think is that, you know, if MSPs who are listening to this podcast have not had their customer contracts reviewed recently, I mean, we're talking in this conversation about solutions to, for example, ransomware that we've implemented within the last month um, in response to the Kaseya incident. So, you know, these, these the, the templates that will be available through the MSP Alliance are the culmination of you know, 15 years of doing customer contracting, you know, on a regular continuous basis for MSPs all over the country. So, uh, and, and they have built into them all of the types of things that I've seen over the years in terms of practice where MSPs could get in trouble contractually. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so th- look, for those of you who are saying, okay, where do I start? How do I, this is all good, Rob. What do I do next? Well, Number one, um, yes, you can start to. Uh, we will will be we will be announcing more and more document uh, agreements uh, that you will be able to buy and either use yourself with your own legal counsel or take them to to Rob and his firm at Scott and Scott and have them do it for you. They've been doing it the longest that I'm aware of. I'm I'm not aware of a of another MSP specific firm out there that has been doing it for this long. And 
the point is that you need to do it and you need to get it updated because so much has changed. Like if you've last updated your agreement like five years ago, Rob, I mean, there's so everything has changed in five years in managed services law. Yeah, I mean, just the data privacy piece, you know, in our master services agreement, you know, there's a whole section on regulatory compliance and data privacy where you see a laundry list of regulations, many of which were not even in place five years ago. Right. <laughs> right. So, look, go get it reviewed. Um, it doesn't matter who you get it reviewed. If you want to use Rob's firm, it doesn't matter. But get it get it reviewed by someone who is a professional, who who's, a, who's an attorney, understands this. If you are interested in obtaining your own copy of the third-party disclosure uh, template, um, you, you have to be an MSP, but send us an email. Uh, send us an email at mspzone at msplines.com, and we will get you, uh, you know, we, we can tell you how to, to acquire that type of a, of a document. And like I said, there's going to be a lot more coming very, very shortly over the next coming weeks and months, and it's going to be pretty exciting because this is going to, it's going to revolutionize how we make MSPs safe. And by consequence, how we make MSPs and their customers safe through the, the fair, equitable distribution of risk throughout that relationship. Rob, I, I think I don't want to use your words or, or misuse your words, but you've used that a lot. And I, I like that phraseology. Look, you know, this is a win. You know, you need a contract that's going to help you win deals. <laughs> right? I mean, in the end, this is part of the sales process. Absolutely. So we, we want to arm the members with better than market terms and conditions that are more transparent and more detailed, um, that are more clear about who's responsible for what and what's included and excluded, uh, that protect the MSP, to make the MSP not an insurance company, but a service provider like they're supposed to be, but to do so increasingly through this program now, Charles, in a way that's going to be much more affordable than hiring a a law firm. Because the first stack that will become available will include the master services agreement, which we recommend that the MSP has every customer sign, as well as a managed services agreement, a backup and disaster recovery agreement, a cloud and hosting agreement, and a service level agreement, as well as the third-party service provider. So this is a stack, Charles, that an MSP that's providing primarily core managed services that's not dealing with regulated entities, uh, this is that package that they could take and run with. This is going to be something that's going to be quick to implement. You know, you, you download these forms, and within, you know, a couple of weeks, you should be able to go live. No, it's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting, and it's and it makes you safer, and that's what we all want. Uh, definitely, it's what we've been all working towards for twenty one years. Anyway, we're at the end of our of our time. Rob, thank you again for joining us on the MSP Zone and, and sharing uh, your experience and, and expertise with us. Thank you, Charles. As you know, these are topics that I enjoy discussing. Absolutely. Well, until next time, it's Charles Weaver and Rob Scott saying um, a farewell. Be safe. Be risk averse if you can. And we will see you next time on the MSP Zone. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a like. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast so you will get notified when future episodes are released. We will see you next time in the MSP Zone.